Lord and Father, we just come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity of being together today, Father. And Father, we thank you for Stephanie and we thank you for her life. We pray, Lord, that you bless her abundantly on her birthday, Lord. And we thank you for the blessing that she is in this congregation, Father. We thank you for the love that surrounds her and for the lo your love that she shares with all that she needs. We just ask, Lord, that you continue blessing her and that you can continue being a light wherever she goes. Continue being the salt on the earth and the light on the earth. We bless her life and we thank you. Father, as we go into your word this morning, tonight, we just ask you, Lord, to open our spiritual ears, that we would be able to hear, so that the word would not just be something that we, we hear, but something that we do. Father, teach us how to learn your word. Teach us how to become doers of your word. We thank you for what you are giving, the revelations you're giving to us on a daily basis. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, so today we're doing lesson five and lesson six. I'll just see how we're going. Maybe we'll just do this at five. I'll just see how we're going. Okay? Our Bible observation. So, going to the homework. I'll do the homework today. Homework. I want your answers. Question one. Complete the following. In the topical method of Bible research, you... Chase a selected topic through the Bible. Chase a selected topic through the Bible. Amen. Do you know what that means? I'll explain it <laughs> Okay, number two. There are two main, major, part, major parts of a language that need to be studied. What are they? Vocabulary and grammar. Vocabulary and grammar. Good. Question three. What are the three things you do when approaching a study? Take a particular interest in the teacher. Study the keyword or words in it. Gather all available sources. Okay. Amen. Question number four. There is an example of a three-stage approach of doing a study. What are these three stages? Definition, structural analysis, organization, summary, and Okay. Question number five. Sorry. What are the six questions to ask when analyzing scripture? What, when, where, why, and how. Okay. Question number oh, lesson number six. Question number one. Approximately approximately how many people are mentioned in the Bible? Okay. Question number two. Peter had two other given names that he was also called. What are they? Simon. 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 Question number three. Give an example of an Old Testament Hebrew changing in spelling when translated into the New Testament Greek. Question number four. List six of the ten suggest suggested questions to ask about a character. Positive and negative character traits. Um, I'll go on. Their failures and their successes. What influence did they have? What was their relationship with God? And what topics can we draw from their life? Okay. Question number five. Fill in the blanks. Well, well, will someone read that whole thing, please? What is the? What is the hereditary background? Continue. Of the person. What was happening politically and religiously at the time of this person? What major events occurred during the person's life? What were the significant relationships of the person? What character traits does the person reveal? What practical topics can be applied to your life from this character study? Amen. Okay, would you all hear that? Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to go first, let me just take this out for a little while.
We're going to do first about how to study a topic, and then we, if we have time, we will go about the character. Um, many times we think that it's difficult for us ourselves to do a study on, on, on a biblical topic or on a, a biblical subject. And so we tend to wait on others for others to tell us about it. And in, in actual fact, we sell ourselves short because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And when we are connected with the Holy Spirit, yes, we need counsel of others and we need advice of others. But the Holy Spirit is no better teacher than the Holy Spirit. So if we have a Bible, and, and if you've got a, a notebook and a pen and a Bible, and you are in, con in connection with the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that you cannot, cannot research. So we sell ourselves short. You know, we want somebody else to do the work for us. So sometimes it's not just that we think we can't do it, sometimes we are actually lazy to do it. But, you know, um, the very first uh, character study that I did, I learned so much about this person's character that there's so many times that I've heard other people teaching me about, about biblical characters and you retain a little bit. But when you do it yourself, you get an insight of the topic that you're doing or the character that you're doing that, that you wouldn't have if you just hear someone else speak. So if you have time and, and there's certain subjects that you like, whatever you're facing in life, there might be some things that I really have to know about the subject because I'm dealing with this. And you might not be able to just find a topic or find a pastor to explain it to you. But if you've got a Bible, you'll be able to ask the Holy Spirit to, to reveal to you. So the Bible says in Proverbs 2, from verse 3 to 6, it reads like this. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And so, so, so what, what, what is the, um, uh, I forgot the word. Um, to be able to get this knowledge and understanding, what do you have to do? It says you have to, um, it says you have to seek it like silver and search for it as if you're searching for hidden treasures. So if you think, how do, how do the, the gold prospectors or the silver prospectors, how do they search for gold? They just, they, they just go for the river and see, oh, is there any nuggets here? No, no, and go on. No, when it, was, when it was in the river banks, they used to dig and they used to go with those sifts and look for the nuggets. And then when, when the gold disappeared from those river beds, they started making mines and going deep because they knew if there had been gold there, there was going to be mines with gold. And they went deep and they dug and they would go from morning to night and search. So the Bible says here, if we search and if we go deep and we go deep and dig deep, we, we are going to get the, the treasures of, of the Word of God. And um, Jeremiah 29, 13 also says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Sometimes we, we, we stay on the verse and we just say, um, God says that if I seek him, I will find him. Yes, if you seek him, you will find him. But how do you have to seek him? You've got to seek him with all your heart. And when you go deep into the Word of God, when you're going like a topical and you're really researching a topical, a topic or subject, that is when you are going deep. So I'm, I want to give you a more practical way of like, um, how do I usually um, research a topic or or a subject? And I know that there will be various different ways, and you're all going to have your own styles, and you're going to have ways that works better for you. For me, everything that I do works better if I write it down. If I just read it and I don't write it down, I will tend to forget it. If I write it down, I might not even have to go back to my notes, but I will really remember it. It's like making a shopping list. Um, if I go without a shopping list, I'll forget, even though I've said it in my mind. If I write it down, I probably don't have to look at my shopping list, but I've written it down and I'll remember it. And with the Word of God, I find it's, it becomes the same. So, one of the advice that I, I really want to give you is, don't start your topic research by looking at other people's commentaries. <coughs> Because then you're not actually doing a biblical research. You are doing a research of what other people researched already. So if you want to know, like, if, if you go online and you put tithing, you're going to get so many different um, 
um, different commentaries of people that have said, I've researched this and there's this verse and there's that verse. And, and it's a wonderful, and many times before even I teach, I go listen on YouTube and I listen to messages on the subject that I'm going to teach and on the subject that I need. Uh, when I needed healing, I listened to a lot of messages about healing. But there came a time that I had to get my own Bible and I had to go look for all the scriptures that had in the Bible about healing. So there's a, there's, I don't know, um, when I spoke with Stephanie and Macy and Josh, um, they didn't know about this. I've got a Bible that's called a study Bible. It's not this cover because my cover was falling apart. Okay? <laughs> but my Bible is a study Bible. This is an NIV study Bible. But if you could get a New King James study Bible, for me, I actually think it's the best. So a study Bible is, is an amazing instrument to have. And I know that you can get most things on the internet. But there's nothing like really having the study Bible. And this study Bible, I, you can look at it during the break if you want to look at it. Anyway, it's got the, the same as the other Bibles. But on the side, I mean, yeah, there's these little annotations. So it means, yeah, like it's got, it's got the verse and there's got a little annotation there. So I, I mean, I've, I've opened in Exodus and I'm on, in Exodus 33 verse 19. And next to it, it's, it's got num number 32, 19. Um, it's got Deuteronomy 8, 18, which means that this verse, what it says, yeah, in Deuteronomy 9, 17, it's also got the same, um, what this verse is talking about is also spoken about in that other verse. So, so it's, it's amazing because when you're looking, you, you look at corresponding verses. And when you're looking like in the New Testament, you, you might find corresponding verses to the Old Testament. So you can see, oh, this was spoken about in Isaiah. And this was, so it's got the corresponding verses so that you can see, you know when the, when the Word of God says that God doesn't just tell you a thing once, it's repeated and it's repeated in more than one place in the Bible. So you can actually see where it is repeated. And this really, really, really helps. And then at the bottom, it's got the explanations of the verses themselves. So it will tell you like the summary. Okay, when this happened, this was what was happening. It will give you an insight of what is happening. And then at the, at the back, it's got the Bible Concordance. So the Bible Concordance um, tells you, um, just say you're looking for something to do with fear. You're struggling with fear. So you look at the Bible Concordance, you look for it, it's in alphabetical order, and it tells you all the, the, all the verses that speak about fear. Um, and, and it tells you like, so, so this, this is really an amazing tool. But if you don't have this, um, the, the internet is an amazing place as well. And probably more accessible to you. Gateway. Any of you use Bible Gateway? Okay, Bible Gateway is really, really good. So you just write Bible Gateway and this this first thing comes up. You put your, your just say I want to know about, we, we speak, the, the example that you had in your notes was about tithing, so I'm going to be speaking about tithing, okay? So I just put tithe. Alright, tithe, I enter. And it's going to tell me all the verses that speak about tithe. If you look here on the right hand side, it actually tells me there's 37 verses. <laughs> Can you read there? Wow, yeah. 37 verses that speak about tithe. And first it gives me the Old Testament, and then at the bottom it gives me the New Testament. So I can go one by one and actually read. On the side they were, they were like this, one by one, one after each other. Starts with Malachi 3 verse 10, 8 to 10. And, and I can go one by one and see which ones are the ones that I, that I want to read. And if you go down, you will, it will go all the rest, like in Genesis, in Leviticus, and you can read all of them. And what's also good is that you don't only see that verse, but it, you've got a little thing here that says in context. Like for example, yeah, Genesis 14, 20. So it tells me in context, if I put in context, it gives me the whole context. In this context, this, this verse comes up. Because sometimes we can't make theories from just one verse. So we're going to see, why is it speaking about tithing? You see what's before, you see what's after. And if you want, you can actually also see the whole chapter. So this, this is an, a, an amazing tool that you can use when you're doing a, a, um, a topical study. Another thing that, that I like to do is there's this little thing over here. See that little thing over here that looks like a, this here? That is parallel, like um, 
Uh, I've got, I've got, the, I've got the, the verses that are coming up here are in uh, King James Bible, but I want to know what they're like in, in other translations because sometimes other translations bring you insight that you don't see in one translation. So when you put there, it will give you the parallel. So over here, I've got it in King James and the Amplified Bible. So you see, like, just, just to look at the difference. So you see, so King James and the Amplified. And, and you can choose as many, you can put three, four, or five, all, all, all next to each other. And then you can see which one is the one that, that the translation is more significant for you, for what you are thinking. For example, you know the verse that says, um, God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of, of love, power, and a sound mind. In some, in some um, translations it says sound mind. In other translations it says discipline. It's not sound mind means you have discipline, but just the way that it's, that it's, that it's spoken is different. And one of the things that I used to struggle with, and I, I'm still dealing with that, is having self-discipline. So one time, though, I was speaking to one of the sisters, and I said to her, no, there's one thing that I don't have is discipline. And she said, no, but the Bible says that it's given you a spirit of love, power, and discipline. So there's no reason. But because there's different translation. So sometimes it's very important to see the different translations. Okay, so basically that's what I wanted to show you there. Oh, um, I showed you last week about Bible Hub, right? Just go there again. Oops. So I'm going to go again. I'm just going to use the, the example of Malachi 3 verse 10. So I've got Malachi 3 verse 10. Um, when you're studying a topic, you, you, you have to find out what the actual meanings of the words were. And also, not just what it means in your language. So when I want just the word tithe, for example, the first thing I will do, look it up. If you don't really know what it means, look it up in an English dictionary. What does tithe mean? So if you go online, you've actually got, there's usually a choice of, it's just got the dictionary choice, or it's got the biblical dictionary choice. So if you choose a biblical dictionary choice, it will tell you what tithe actually means. But then you want to go look at the original language. So you go on to Bible Hub, you come here to, you, I've put the, the verse, I come here to Lexicon. And it's giving me the verse in, in English, in Hebrew, and how it sounds. And then it's got those little letters, which is the strong, the little numbers which is the strong um, description. So if you just put there, so it tells you yeah, the, the, what it means, definition. Tithe means a tenth part. You see there? And if I go here to the number, it tells me what the word, what is the original word in, this one would be in Hebrew because, because um, Malachi was still in Hebrew. So that's what the original word means. Short definition is tithe. What was the word origin, where it came from, where, what it meant. Um, the translations, and it tells you all the things that where you can go about the tents and, and tithing. So, so th these are tools that you can use to find out. But there's, there's an, one thing that you've always got to remember. Just like when you're studying something to teach at school, you've got to work and you've got, to, you've got these tools that you've got to put into action and, and they will work for you. But if you're doing it just like that, this is all you're going to get. You're just going to get the head knowledge. So before you do this, you always have to ask the Holy Spirit to give you the revelation, to take you to what you need to, what you need to hear. So it's not just about knowing what it means, it's not just about knowing what the dictionary says, not just about knowing what it reads, but what, what do you need to know for your specific situation? So usually after I know exactly what, 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 what the word means, it's like I go and I say, okay, so what does this mean to me? That is the what, okay, you know what it means, what does it mean to me? From, from the verse, does it say that I have to do something with it? Do I have to do something? Is something that's got to come from my part? Do I have to believe or do, that, is it a practical thing? Because I can believe in tithing, but if I don't put it into practice, then I, I'm, not, I'm not doing what this verse tells me to do. Then you've got to see and say, okay, so this verse tells me, t speaks to me about tithing. I'm, I'm just speaking about tithing because that's what, what was in your notes. I'm using the same example, okay? So it says, um, this verse says, so who does this verse say should tithe? So if you go if you go to the, to the verse, let's just try and see if I can go to the verse again. Okay. 
Who does the verse say that, we, that should, should tithe? Who, who do you think should tithe? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. Okay. If you are a servant of God, because God says, does man rob me? So when he speaks man, it doesn't mean just man. Yeah. He, man is man and human beings. General. So, so God says, does man rob me? You know, you ask me, where, where, do, you, where do I rob you from? And then he says, you bring the whole tithe into the household. So one of the important things is like, who, who should tithe? And then it's like, sometimes people think, oh, um, I can give part of my tithe. And there's, there's a very important thing in this, in this verse, is the second word, it says, bring the whole tithe. It's not part of your tithe. It's not, a, it's not um, whatever I feel like, the whole tithe. So to you, what does tithe mean? What do you know about tithing? 10%. 10%. It's a tenth. Yeah. Tenth, okay? And it says bring the whole tenth. And then, and then <clears throat> the next thing is where. Okay, so from, from this verse, where do you tithe? <coughs> or a storehouse. Into the storehouse. What is God's storehouse? Church. 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 So tithing... Um, we, we'll go a little bit deep into it, and maybe one day we'll do a, a real teaching just, just on tithing. Tithing, you must give the tithe wherever you are getting your spiritual food from. Because it's like this. When, when um, tithing was instituted in the Old Testament, um, they used to give the tithes to the Levites. Because the Levites were the ones that looked after the church, that made sure the community had what they needed. So they worked for the church. They didn't, they didn't work in the farms, they didn't work anywhere else. So the people would bring the tithe to the Levites. So who, who substitutes the Levites in our church nowadays? Um, it's, it's the pastors, it's the church. So, so the, and, and the Lord says, so that there would be food in my house. So it's like, how can, who's going to make the church function? Because the word is free. The word of God is for free. You can't sell the word of God. You can't sell your praise. You can't sell this. It's given to you free, freely given, you freely give. But for the establishment, for, for the building, for the electricity, for the bills, for everything that, that goes on to make the church function, you need money to come from somewhere. And so for the pastor to be able to be full-time studying the word and equipping people and doing all the things that he's meant to do, he can't be in a business working. His, his money's got, he's got to eat. So bringing the tithes into the storehouse, bringing the tithes into the church is what gives the church the food, the people that work for the church full-time the food. And that's why, why it speaks. So it says, and then it says, um, why should I tithe? What does the, why should you tithe? Give me your, your insight. <coughs> one way to really worship. It's one way to worship God. It's out of obedience. Just in this verse, God even tells you another reason why you should tithe. Not just because you love your immune obedience. And then he says, what, what is he going to do if you tithe? See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. I think it's the only verse in the Bible that actually says that you can um, not test God but put, put God's word to the test. Like he says, do this and see if I won't do it. So actually like, you know, a lot of times when, 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 when I pray, I, um, how I can stand in faith and say, Lord, your word says that you provide for my every need. And, and a lot of times Lord holds in faith and I say, because your word says that if I would tithe, you would open the, the, the gates of heaven. So for me, it's, it's, it, it helps my faith to know, Lord, I've been obedient. And your word says this. So I know that you're going to provide for my every need. Because I can put your word to the test. And you've said it. So that helps. So how do you tithe? Do you tithe like, okay, God's word says I should tithe. And so I'm going to, I'm, I have to tithe. So it's out of like this, this rule, I have to tithe. So I get this envelope and I say, oh, you know, I just, this would be so good if I could use this to pay this. You know, I didn't have to put this money here. Uh, there's so much I could do with it, but you know, I've got to be obedient to God. Oh, you know, and you take the envelope and you're going to put it in and you think, oh, you know. <laughs> you think God's going to bless you if, if that is your tithe attitude. You just, 
You're doing it out of obligation. You're being obedient, but you're resenting it. God says you must give with a, with a joyful heart. Give joyfully. And, and the Word of God says it's better to give than to receive. So there's no hard, fast rules like you give a tenth and you're going to get 100%. That, that type of prosperity teaching is wrong. God wants us to prosper, but there's a, a way to prosper. It's the Word of God says that you, uh, Paul actually says, may you prosper as, 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 as your soul prospers. So God wants you to prosper. As you are prospering spiritually, He can trust you to prosper um, financially or materially because you're not going to leave Him to follow the riches. Because a lot of times people are after the blessing and they forget the one they blessed. So in everything, God, it's not like, oh, you give 10% and you're going to get 100. So I'm going to give God, it's like I buy a pig and I, I give God a ham because I want five pigs. That's not the way it works. It's like, no, you give it the joyful life. You give out of obedience. But when you're no longer in the Old Testament. So a lot of people will tell you, look, um, this tithing thing is for the Old Testament because it was in the law. And we're no longer part of the law. Right? And that's true. But do you know that um, Abraham was before Moses, right? And the law was given to Moses. Abraham was before Moses and Abraham tithed. So it wasn't a, a, a man-made law or a, a, a mosaic law. Um, the tithing was a spiritual law that God implemented to be able to bless people. So it's, it's different than, than, than a mosaic law. So when, when, they, when people say to you that it's, it's no longer covered because we are under the new covenant, we're not in the old covenant, that is the thing that, 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 that we can see. Yes, but this is not a, a part of the mosaic law. This was, a, a, it's like, um, it's what God instituted to be able to, to bless. You, you will see in, I don't know if I've written down yet, that um, there's part of the Bible that says that Abraham um, gave a tenth to Melchizedek and he used to tithe. And so it was a law that was instituted already. And then a lot of people will tell you, no, but there's nowhere in the New Testament that I see them speak about tithe. And the actual word tithe only speaks, is only spoken in the New Testament when it's referring to things of the Old Testament. Um, but do you, do you know when, when, when someone is already doing what they're meant to be doing, Everybody in the New Testament knew that it was God's people tithed. It, it was it was um, it was common knowledge. So they didn't really have to address it because that's what God's people did. They tithed. And when people say to you, "Look, um, I want to be like the first church," and there's no way I see them speaking about tithing. You know what the first church did? They sold everything they had and they gave it all. So it's like. If you want to do that, you're welcome as well. The church is not going to tell you no, but then you've got a living community. And, and so it's like this. And yes, um, you know, my, my nephew actually once, um, he had such a, a, an amazing revelation. He, he'd been born again since he was a little baby. And when he was about 12 years old, um, the Lord gave him this amazing gift. I'll speak to you about that when we do this, the gifts of the Spirit. And he actually started playing the keyboard without anybody teaching him. It was the Holy Spirit that taught him how to play. And, and so he's, really, he's, he's, he's a worship leader and he was the worship leader in the church. And he's at an amazing time. So ever, ever since he even started from his very first salary, he knew that it was God's will to tithe. So he always tithed. So he said that one day, he, he's, he's got a very successful life. Of all his brothers, he's the only one that's, that's successful, actually, of, of his whole part of the family. And, and he was very proud because, you know, God, I really know your law, and I know how to tithe, and you've prospered me. And one day he heard, like, the Holy Spirit say, what are you so proud about? You know, like, the guy that prays and says, God, I'm so happy because I'm not like the other one because I serve you. So he was, like, in a, in a way, was doing the same. But he was being obedient to God. And God said to him, what are you so proud about? What you're doing is your obligation. Tithing is like, it's, it's what instituted that you have to do. What is above that? That you should be proud of. When you give your offerings, if you're generous in your offerings, then that's something to be proud of. Wow, I was really generous. But tithing, that is your obligation. You're supposed to do that. So sometimes we do, wow, I'm really good because I tithe. You're supposed to do it. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, so one of the things that's also important when you study a topic is remember not to just, um, it depends how, how deep you want to go, okay? Because if you're going to study, there's some topics that you could go for months 
just studying that topic and you would still find because you'd read one verse and then you'd see that this verse is linked to that other verse and then you'd have to check that verse and then so there's things that if you want to make it short you just go to the simple ones the ones that you want but if you want to really go deep you can really go deep but don't always just look at the new testament i know a lot of times we have the tendency of just going to the new testament but see what the old testament speaks about as well because sometimes it's important and one of the things like for example also not everything is the same like for example um let me give you an example fear you'll see if you put fear there, there is so many verses about fear but you you actually got to sort of develop them and see read and see the context that it's in because some of the fear that's speaking it's spoken of in the bible is the fear of the lord so if you are addressing the subject and you want to know how do i deal with fear those those verses that speak about the fear of the Lord is not what you are searching for. You're searching for like, how do I address it? When I get fear, how do I deal with it? What does God tell me about fear? So you eliminate those that's got that to do, and you write down the ones that have to do with your topic. If what you are researching has got to do with how do I reverence God, how do I fear God, then you take all the other ones away and you just put those. So it's, it's better like I find if I... I, I I'm still I'm old school, okay? So I, I, I get paper, I like putting things on paper. The other day, like my, my husband was saying, oh, you can put your notes on, on the computer. It's hard for me. I prefer <laughs> to write it like this and then all these like, and it's okay, you know? <laughs> so I'll put the thing, I'll speak about the verse and then I'll put all the, the like a page with the, the verses that, that I'm going to address. What does each verse tell me about? What can I glean from that verse that's linked with the other one but is not in the other one? Because you're going to find all these things, that's not, it's like a puzzle put together. And then after you've put all these pages together with all these different verses, with all the different things that you've gained knowledge from, uh, like what do you do, what do you don't do, what does the Bible say, must I believe, must I not believe, all these different things. Then you put it like together in a puzzle and then you make a summary. Okay, from this then I know, this is the way this principle works. Okay? So... One of the things that um, I wanted to speak to you about also on this subject is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the law of first mention. So most biblical scholars say that the first time something is mentioned in the Bible, unless it's specifically addressed later on that that's not what the meaning is, or in the context that's not what it means, the first time that it's mentioned in the Bible is the way you should address it throughout the Bible. Uh, for example, one of the examples, so it's like, if the first time that this was mentioned in the Bible, it meant that that's what it was addressing, it meant you should do that. Whenever you see that mentioned in the Bible further on, it's addressing the same, the same thing. And one of the things that, that for example, is when, when is the blood first mentioned in the Bible? In Bible and God said, your brother's blood is calling out from the ground. So we all know that it was not the blood itself, it was like his life had gone from him. And so straight away, blood was related to life. So every time you see in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament about blood, it's always related to life. It's either about life or it's about sacrifice. Then you see the, the correlation. Remember when Moses had to put the blood on the doorpost and had to sacrifice the lamb? But also the, the blood was what covered the, the lamb. Just like when, when God had to slaughter the animal to cover the sin of, 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 um, of Adam and Eve. So blood is always considered the one that in the Old Testament covers the sin, in the New Testament washes away the sin. But blood mean, means life. And um, so we, whenever we speak about blood, we know that it's either to do with sacrificial, um, um, uh, about sacrifice or about life. And so in, in Genesis, um, it's, it's a book of beginnings, so you'll see a lot of foundation for things in Genesis is, um, is the concept is in Genesis. So it speaks to you about divine, divine creation, it speaks to you about paradise, it speaks to you about marriage, what does God, how does God institute marriage, it speaks to you about sin, sacrifice, atonement, all these things are, 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 are mentioned in Genesis. And even when Jesus spoke about, um, for example, when Jesus spoke about marriage, he spoke about things of Genesis. He actually said in Matthew 19, 4, 4 to 5, he says, um, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one, one flesh. So the first time marriage was mentioned was in Genesis. So that was 
the first mention, the law of first mention. And that the way that God instituted marriage in Genesis was the way marriage should be seen until the end of Revelation. It's not going to change. The concept of marriage is not going to change because man changed. That was the way God saw it. And um, so one of the things that's important, like, um, we've got to see that the Bible when it brings a concept into being. Um, if it's in the beginning of the Bible, um, the concept will always be the same throughout the Bible. God doesn't change his mind halfway. Okay, I've gone down, um, creation's gone a thousand years living, now I'm going to change the concept. Now you, th there's no blood for sin anymore. God doesn't change the concept. The concept that he instituted in, in Genesis is the same concept that is going to go all the way into until Revelation and until the end of times. Because the word of God says that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain the same. So the same concept is going to happen. And um, but then we also have to see that that, that that we are understanding it in context because us being human sometimes we say okay so every time light is mentioned this is what is mentioned but go read in context and see that the, the scripture that you're reading is, is in context to what you're understanding for example what does the serpent mean in Genesis the serpent, serpent. in Genesis who was the serpent Satan, Satan. Satan. Okay, so and, and, and God says that the man, um, the woman is going to have, have a child that's going to, with his heel, is going to put out the, the head of the serpent, right? The head of Satan. Um, later on, um, you will see that in the time of Moses, um, the people had sinned and they got very sick. And Moses got, got um, a pole and, uh, 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 and, and there was a, a brass serpent around the pole and they lifted it up. And when the people looked at the, at the brass serpent, uh, they were healed. Is that serpent the, the same serpent as the one in Genesis? It's not. That, that, that serpent on the, on, on the cross with the, with the rod was the serpent, uh, was um, uh, speaking about salvation. About, it's actually a symbol of Jesus Christ. You know what, today, even still in pharmacies and things of medicine, you still have the pole of the serpent. And it came from, from that example. So you've got to look at it in context. You can't just say, oh, because me this, it's going to mean all the way. You've always got to look in context what, what it means. But one of the reasons that I brought for you the, the reason of first mention is because sometimes we take scriptures out of context because we don't realize these rules. And have you ever heard people speak about Paul's thorn in the flesh? In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 9, if you want to read, it says like this. And lest, this is Paul speaking, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made per per perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than, than, the, than the power of Christ may rest upon me. So, what he's saying is like, there's a thorn in the flesh. Because, because I get so much revelation from God, I could probably become boastful. I can become proud. And so, a thorn in the flesh was given me so that my pride doesn't overtake what I'm doing. And when I asked God, take away this thorn, God said to me, my, my grace is sufficient for you. So a lot of people, what, what do most of you understand as being the thorn in the flesh? What do you think the thorn in the, what have you been taught? What was the thorn in the flesh? What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? Sickness. Sickness, right? Most people have been taught it was sickness. I've also heard that, that uh, thing, but... Whenever, wherever in the New Testament did you see somebody that was sick that went to Jesus and said, Jesus, heal me. And Jesus said, no, because it's going to make you prideful. So you've got to stay sick. For my glory, you're going to stay sick. Do you see that anywhere? The example. Does, does sickness bring glory to God? Healing brings glory to God. Sickness doesn't. So... When we see this, we think, okay, this sounds strange because it says it was a thorn in the flesh, it was on his side. But now, you know, um, we, we have a, a wrong interpretation because I was thinking of, of, of sickness. So I'm going to show you that a thorn in the flesh was actually an idiom 
used by Paul. You know what an idiom means? An idiom is like a saying. Just like say, just like if I tell you, I um, uh, I've bitten more than I can chew. What does it mean? I've bitten more than I can chew. I've taken on um, a greater job than what I can do. It doesn't mean that I'm eating, you know, it's not really about chewing. It's like if I say, oh, I've, I've, take, I've bitten more than I can chew, it means like, okay, I said I would teach Bible school, but I really can't do it. I've taken on more than what I can do. Okay, so that's what an idiom means. It's like a, it's a, it's a phrase used to exemplify something. And so Paul, you, we've always got to remember that Paul was a Pharisee, so Paul was a biblical scholar, so he knew the scriptures very well. So I'm going to show you in the Old Testament, the first time that a thorn in the flesh comes up, and how many times a thorn in the flesh, and you're going to see what a thorn in the flesh actually means. So if you look at Numbers 33 verse 55, Numbers 33 55 says like this, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you have let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your flesh, and they shall arrest you in the land where you dwell. So if you really look at this verse, who is the thorn in the flesh? People. It says that if you don't drive them out, they're going to be a thorn in your side and they are going to arrest you. Okay, so that was the first time that the, the Bible speaks about a thorn in the flesh. Right after that, in Joshua 23, 13, again, it says like this, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they will be snares and traps to you and scourge you on your sides and be thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land. So who again is it? The nations that were against Israel. They were again the thorns in the flesh. Judges 2.3 says it's again, Therefore I, will also, um, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will be thorns in your side, and their gods will be a snake to you. So look how many times, every time that a thorn in the flesh is spoken about, it's never about disease. It's always about people. People that are going to harass the, the people of God. So with this in mind, we see that Paul knew um, what the, the, the idiom thorn in the flesh meant. And so when he used it, he used it with the mind of saying, this is, this is the, the, these people is who Satan is sending me to buffet me. Okay, so when you, when you look at the word buffet, you've also got to see, okay, so what does buffet mean? What does, you know, because it says it's going to be to buffet, to buffet me. So in the, in, in the English dictionary, buffet actually means to heat repeatedly. So these thorns in the flesh are what are going to heat him repeatedly so that he doesn't get into pride. So we're going to see, what, what's this true? Were there people that deliberately heat Paul the, repeatedly so that he wouldn't have pride? So we're going to see some examples, and I'm not going to read all of them because they're really too many. But Acts 13, verse 49 to 52, Actually, I'm going to start with verse 50. It says like this, But the Jews stirred up the devout and the prominent woman and the chief men of the city and raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. Yeah, the were these thorns in the flesh, battering, Peter, um, battering Paul. Acts 14, verse 1 to 4, <coughs> verse 2 says, But the unbelieving Jews turned up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the Christians. Again, but buffering Peter. Acts 14, 19. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and they dragged, out, dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. Again, they came against him. And I'll, ju I'll just tell you the rest, but I'm not going to read it. Acts 16, 22. At 17, 10 to 15, at 20 to 20, at 20 verse 23, and then there's some in Ephesians. Okay, in 1 Corinthians verse 4, um, again Paul uses the same word, uses the same word, buffet, but he says, I've been beaten. And he says, um, we, we labor with our hands, but we're being reviled, we're blessed. We are being persecuted, we endure. We are defamed, we, we entreat. 
Um, we have been made as the filth of the world and the offscoring of things until now. So when Peter's saying, look, this is what they've been doing to us. They've been defaming us. They've been hitting us. They've been, do you think it sounds like a thorn in the flesh? Something that just wouldn't let go. And every time things got better and people got born again, then the thorn in the flesh would come again and come grip him again and he'd again be persecuted and he'd again have to move city and he'd again have to it sounds like you know something they thought it was like if you think you've got a thought in the flesh it just never lets go and there's always that nagging pain and always you see then okay so we see this is what's happening to Paul okay so we should think okay God this is a man after your own heart this is a man that's getting revelations from you this is a man that's spreading the gospel wouldn't it be easier for, for you to just remove those people from him so that he could spread the gospel further? Let's see what Jesus says about persecution. Okay? So when we go and see what Jesus said about persecution, if you read Matthew 5, 11, Jesus says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus said, when you are persecuted for your, for my name's sake, rejoice. Because they've done this for, to me. But rejoice because you are found worthy of being persecuted for my name's sake. Nobody in the Bible, and, and that when, when God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. That's what he was saying. Look, don't worry, my grace, everything that I do for you, is sufficient for you to overcome this persecution. Because nowhere does, does the Bible, Jesus tell anyone, rejoice in your sickness because that um, you, you'll show who I am. There's no way. But the persecution, yes. So we can see the difference. Also in John 15, 18 to 27, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So Jesus himself was beaten. And, and because Jesus was beaten, did people think that he was a weakness? What, what does meek mean? Jesus was meek. That's why he was beaten. He was meek. M-E-E-K. Meek. Meek means, meek doesn't mean he was a loser. Meek doesn't mean he was just um, a nerdy little guy that could not fight for himself and so he let people overcome him. Meek, meek means, I have power, but I have that power under control. And so when he gave his life, it wasn't because he was beaten, because he was weak. His weakness was meekness. And this is what the same that, that is happening with Paul. So notice that persecution and, and weakness for Christ's sake is different than weakness. That's why Paul says, in my weakness, you are made strong. When I am weak, you are strong. Because when we are weak, we let God overtake. And because all these things were happening to him, he didn't become prideful in his own way. And he didn't become too full of himself. Look at me, I'm just this amazing teacher. Because this persecution was always letting him know that he had to depend on God because he would not be able to overcome. He would not, would not have been able to live through the first beating if it wasn't the grace of God. So the persecution kept him in check. <clears throat> so the conclusion from this, just from going from, to the first mentioned rule, because that's what I was trying to explain to you, that when we don't know what it means, always go and see when the, the Word of God first spoke about it, what did it mean, and it usually if it's in the same context as what it means. The conclusion we can come from this is that the, the, the thorn in the flesh um, is to speak of a constant harassment that Paul had to endure when he delivered the gospel. He told the Corinthians that his thorn in the flesh is a messenger sent from Satan to buffet him, which is to beat him, so that he would not be exalted. It was most likely a demonic messenger who followed Paul to various places he went, influenced the unbelieving Jews who stirred up the crowds against him and persecuted him or beat him. So we always, sometimes we think of the people as our enemies. So we could think, all oh, those terrible Jews, look what they were doing at, to, to Paul. 
But from what we see, every city he went to, it happened. So it was actually a demonic influence that would follow Paul, so, and it would influence the people in the city to come against Paul. And we, then Paul would leave, and the demonic um, messenger would follow again to influence the people. Because we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's what the Word of God says. So Paul, even though the harassment was from the people, it was from the influence that was behind the people that was harassing Paul. Okay, so this is um, a study of a topic. And look, if you just go and look and you go and, and search, you're going to find these interesting things that most of you didn't know about, right? And so it's very interesting. So it's like, th there's going to be hundreds of other topics. This is just like a real small example of what we get when we really dig and we search. Okay.